This is an interview with Richard Breeden for the Virtual Museum and Archive of the History of Financial Regulation of the SEC Historical Society. It's the second session. Today is November 20th, 2019. I'm Kenneth Durr, and we're in the offices of Richards, Kibbe, and Orby in Washington, D.C. Thanks for coming back again. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Ken. It was a great talk yesterday. We, we talked through a lot of uh, big picture things. I wanna, and we're going to get back to that. But I want to start out with some little picture stuff that I think should stick in your mind. Um, shortly after you became chairman, you had a pretty sizable market break on Wall Street. And shortly after that, you had an earthquake on the Pacific Exchange. <laughs> So there's, take me back to that time and talk about dealing with those. Well, yes, it was the second day. Um, in second, the day after I was sworn in, uh, that it was a Friday, and um, uh, we had a, I call it an aftershock of the 1987 <laughs> big market break, and uh, it, in percentage terms, was much bigger. It was a 211-point drop, as I recall, which, of course, today would be nothing. And um, uh, yawn, oh, 200 points. Um, but then it was a much bigger percentage, uh, five or six percent, I think. I can't remember for sure, but it was enough to get everybody's attention. And it followed the pattern of um, 1987 in that it was happening, there was the shock on Friday, and then everybody had the weekend waiting to see, my goodness, what will happen on Monday. And uh, I was worried that I'd, that there was a button on my desk somewhere. I assumed it, one, that I would eventually find that there was an up button and a down button. And I was afraid that I had leaned on the down button without knowing it, and the market was um, falling at the end of the day. And um, it was, oh, after lunch, Rick Ketchum, who was our, um, who I had inherited as director of Market Reg, and that was one of my lucky days when I inherited Rick, who was awesomely talented in, and, and his knowledge of the trading markets was encyclopedic. Um, and he had some terrific staff members, Brandon Becker, Mike Macchiaroli, who I suspect we'll get to when we talk about capital rules, who's Superman, um, and, uh, and various others. Anyway, Rick comes into the office and said, you know, Mr. Chairman, I don't remember his exact words, but we've got a problem in the market. And he starts describing that stocks are falling. and <clears throat> At that time, there were only two stock quotation terminals in the entire SEC. So there was one out in the hallway between Market Reg and Corp Fin or Enforcement, and one somewhere else, but they were on two different floors. And uh, so while Rick is sitting in my office, we have no idea whether the market has rebounded or or is still going down, and he keeps has a couple people from Market Reg, and they keep going out of the office, going down the hall to the stairwell, going down to run down the hallway to then look at the ticker, write down Dow Jones what 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 the index is, then retrace their step, run back to the chairman's office with this little piece of paper, and I said to myself, you know, among other things, when this is over, we need to fix this. <laughs> this was a mockery. I mean, it was. So um, the market uh, had a bout of confidence problems and some program trading, and it was a Friday afternoon, and the, when the market starts going strongly south, um, late in the afternoon on a Friday, most traders were not knowing, well, why don't I just be flat and um, Monday morning I can put positions back on again. So people, uh, I think, are reluctant to step in front of a train if the market has decided to move somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so it just, and if you have an imbalance, the 
whether it's a lot of buy orders as the young Chinese markets had when we helped set up the Shanghai market, and you have a couple billion people thinking owning stocks is the way to get rich, so you have this huge order book and very little supply, so if you have a lot of buys and no sells, or if you have a lot of sells and no buys, a market can move very rapidly and, and it'll overshoot the mark of where it ought to end up just because of the imbalance. So we had that and then that put the press and everyone else into a frenzy of, oh my goodness, are we going to repeat 87 again? And of course, 87 had the uh, several unfortunate events, which I had um, remembered from the time and, and studied, one of which was then Chairman Reuter wondering out loud, I mean, he was at a speech at the Mayflower Hotel and walking through the corridor and people asking him what the SEC was going to do and he wondered out loud that perhaps we would close the markets and then that caused the decline to accelerate because no one wants to be, no one wants to be trapped in a market that's closed. And I think generally policymakers in Washington tend to be insensitive of how critical it is for markets to be open. Um, you, know, you have trillions of dollars of value and closing the market is equivalent to a temporary expropriation of those trillions of dollars. You know, people can't, no matter what their needs, they can't get in or out. And so it's a very severe step. David, I think, didn't, in, was an innocent mistake, but you, and it's hard, I think, for many people to understand the power of words when you're in a government leadership position with the media and things that can be communicated all over the world very rapidly. I, having worked for years at that point in the White House, I was pretty familiar with the what happens in the press briefing room and, and the frenzy that can be triggered anyway, so I was quite careful to make sure I didn't make any press comments and uh, as soon as the market closed, I briefed the chief of staff, the secretary of the treasury, the Fed, everybody in sight about what we knew, which was very little other than that this came out of nowhere. We didn't know of anything fundamental that was underlying this. There was no firm that was about to declare bankruptcy. There was no um, structural reason that we could identify for this. Rick Ketchum called around to all the firms on Wall Street and you know nobody knew what was going on. Nobody was particularly worried. There's it's not, oh, this is the reaction to X, Y, or Z. This it was a mystery to people. And so, you know, our message to everyone was just stay calm. Things will sort themselves out. There's nothing wrong. And markets just do funny things, and you sometimes have to wait for them to correct themselves, which, and Monday morning, uh, sure enough, we had a big meeting all day Saturday, I had uh, all the division directors, we had lots of people in, who knows what, you know. Are you gaming out what you might do if the market continued down? Uh, there wasn't a lot of gaming to do. If the market goes down, it's gonna go down. What is there to do? And there is this, I mean, the Japanese and the Chinese sometimes, and the, particularly the Japanese in those years, had this sometimes thought that, well, you could tell a market which way to go. And you know, in Japan, you had a big scandal two or three years into my term where the Japanese securities firms were promising their customers that they would never lose money, that if they made profits, the customer would get those. If the stocks fell in value, that Nomura or Nikko, the big firms, would reimburse them. Well, you can't have a one-sided market. Markets move in both directions. And I, I remember giving a speech in uh, Buenos Aires one time and telling people, you, you know, you fundamentally have a choice. You, you can be governed by markets or by ministers. Um, 
and that's an election an economy has to make and if it's going to be governed by markets you can't pretend they're markets but then still want to manage them i mean it's it's a capital market if it doesn't like the economic policies that somebody in a country is pursuing the bond market may fall out of bed hard land hard and so we didn't have a game plan for what we were going to do to control the market i mean it was going to do what it wanted to what i wanted to make sure was that we didn't have rumors, speculation, um, any kind of uncertainty about what the government might be about to do. Our orders were just everybody needed to be at work and available to talk to people from the street if they wanted to communicate. And we were very interested in staying abreast of the situation, but we weren't going to close the market or take. How about the Pacific so, Exchange event? Do you remember that one? Uh, I do, not as well, but I mean, I remember they had an earthquake, and I think we shifted trading from San Francisco down to Los Angeles, uh, and had to do some rewiring of some of the trading mechanisms. That was harder in those days. Um, because the technology wasn't such that you could, that everybody was connected to everything. It was also harder because we had either not yet done or, or were just about to do or had just recently done multiple trading of options. So at that time, the regional exchanges, their bread and butter was trading options and they had monopoly trading privileges. So if you had uh, Intel and somebody else had IPM and if Intel was something that was generating a lot of options values that would be going on one regional exchange and not the others and so very lucrative but if you had an outage well you had a problem because if people needed to trade options on Intel that trading post is now under a three feet of concrete because the building fell down and so we had to, and, and technically it was not legal to trade them other places. Well, the commission can give emergency relief to something like that and say, all right, the market, and I think in that case, the physical market makers from San Francisco moved and went to uh, Los Angeles or another facility where they could operate and so it was this, the same people doing it. And again, market reg jumped in to help make whatever adjustments needed to be made to technical rules that might assume something was happening in San Francisco, which is now happening in, in Philadelphia or Los Angeles. We might have moved some to Philadelphia too. I can't can't remember, okay. but because it's an SRO, so the, the commission has to give it permission to. Exactly. Yeah. So those are those are specific. But those things were, you know, an, an example of why the why it is so important. Only one of millions of examples of why it is so important for the SEC to have such talented staff that are experienced and knowledgeable, and um, that that when something happens in the market. And, and you need to respond quickly to prevent dislocations of all kinds breaking out, you can do it because you have the people who have the experience and the knowledge and the insight to, to do it. They were a little unhappy at me when I arrived at the commission, these incredibly valuable people. You know, Japan has this uh, concept of living national treasures in the arts community mostly. Well, I thought of the SEC senior staff as living national treasures, and therefore I thought that they really should have beepers um, so that I could get a hold of them. Pagers. If, pagers, yeah. uh, which they were not accustomed to wearing. And of course, this is before the now ubiquitous uh, uh, mobile phones, and people didn't have a cell phone. And you know, I know it's hard to imagine that there was once a time without cell phones. I remember the time. But, but there was. <laughs> and while well, somebody might be looking at this interview at some point in the future <laughs> and they won't believe either you or me that there was a time before cell phones. But we didn't have cell phones and 
these divisions. Rick Ketchum was a passionate runner. And he liked to go out some afternoons when he wanted to clear his mind and go run for 10 miles, which I was perfectly fine with. Anything that made Rick happy made me happy. But suppose the market <laughs> decides to start crashing right then. You'd like to be able to have it vibrate somewhere and get him to call home. And so I had been used to in the White House, we all had beepers, and if the president needs to get a hold of you, he needs to get a hold of you. And so the speed of markets was nowhere near then what it is today, but it was still much faster than it had been uh, even five years before, because the telecommunications and the computing revolutions were moving forward forcibly, forcefully, and um, yeah, that was just one example of where the SEC staff, they had no email, they had no beepers, they had no cell phones, they had no computer terminals, they had no trading terminals. It was a wasteland. It was a wonderful agency operating with paper and pencil, a couple of abacuses, but um, the technology was um, Stone Age uh, era technology. And, and in part, and that's not a criticism of the agency not knowing it would like to have technology. Every time it asked for it, it was told no. We don't have room in the federal budget for that, and you don't need this and that. And that was one of the very high priorities I had in the early budget submissions was to make sure that we got um, personal computers for all the staff attorneys and that we linked people so that they could, people in um, the LA office or in Denver could communicate with enforcement in Washington without, you know, quarters in a phone booth. Um, so, so you're keeping up with that technology that's sweeping through the markets. Trying to. And another way to keep up was legislation. And I want to talk about the Market Reform Act. Yes. It, that, that comes in during the first few months. I want to talk about your role in making that happen. Well, I had the great benefit that I had um, been the president's spearhead in passing uh, FI, what became FIREA, the legislation called FIREA, the savings loan legislation. And so I had worked with every committee chair, every ranking minority, every subcommittee chair, every ranking minority of a subcommittee uh, that touched anything financial in the Congress. So um, I had uh, terrific uh, working relationships both with members and, and with their senior staff, which in Congress is quite important. So um, I was, we actually passed both the market reform legislation, the enforcement remedies legislation, and various other riders to appropriations bills to address things that were needed. We had in market reform um, a, we were trying to create what didn't exist, which would be a parallel to the Bank Holding Company Act, which if you have a bank, as we talked yesterday, and it has a holding company, the Federal Reserve oversees the holding company, and then whoever oversees the bank, and that's very cumbersome, and it's an intensive bank-style regulation that the examiners crawl all over the building and do whatever they do. If they would just publish their, res their results of their examinations, people would know what they're doing, but since bank secrecy is on a par in the bank regulatory agencies with the National Secrets Act in the UK and top secret clearances in the US, we don't have the benefit of knowing that. Anyway, you have oversight of holding companies in the banking side, but on the security side, there was nothing. You had the broker-dealer regulated and when Wall Street wa were consisted of large numbers of small partnerships that were living off of fixed commissions and the income that generated, 
Um, you didn't need, they didn't typically have holding companies and you didn't need to have holding company oversight. But once you got Sears Roebuck owning Dean Witter, Prudential Insurance owning Prudential Securities, um, General Electric owning securities affiliate, major, major industrial companies acquiring General Electric owned Kidder Peabody. Um, and so you had big companies that were acquiring broker dealers. And then you had the issue of, well, what happens if um, each of these subsidiaries separately capitalized, but what happens if there's a big problem in one? Is there a contagion risk? Theoretically, there's a contagion risk that, that problems in one area could bring down the overall entity, and that was exactly what happened in Drexel Burnham, uh, where you had problems in the holding company uh, causing the overall entity to fail, though the subsidiary, the broker-dealer subsidiary, was one of the best capitalized firms on the street. Right. And so we had learned, and, and I'm happy to go through uh, Drexel now or wh whenever let's, let's it, put that it, on it hold fits. But, but the Holding Company Act was to deal with making sure that the commission was equipped, or trying, to beginning down the road, of equipping the commission to be able to do something similar that was done on the banking side, but do it with much lighter touch. Extra reporting, large positions, large concentrations of risk needed to be disclosed to the commission, rights to go in and ask questions if need be, but not everything you do is going to, I mean, we were not going to tell General Electric how to build locomotives or send examiners into their locomotive factories. Um, so what we wanted, and of course, the parents were typically all, I think, uh, all public companies. So you start with this market regulation of companies through full disclosure. The 10Ks should contain everything about material risks. But in fast-moving markets, um, there might be times when something that was thought to be immaterial could suddenly become immaterial. So the holding company legislation was intended to cover that. Was this part of the Market Reform Act, or was this a separate legislation? Part of the Market Reform okay. Act. A lot of that, I, I think, had, had, it, had been, it had been coming through for a while. And a lot of it was in response to the 87 market break, right? Well, you'd had the Brady Commission and, and a lot of efforts to study the um, 87 crash. But so, so when you say coming through, things weren't moving hmm. at all. What got them moving? I did. Just go, I mean, to, we go to Congress to, and well, say, we Drexel, want to do this? Well, yes. I mean, you know, I, I knew how to pass legislation. Uh, okay. that, that is not, you're not born knowing that. Right. Um, and I'd had to learn. I mean, I wasn't born knowing it either, but I had to learn in order to do the savings and loan rescue, and it was all the same people. Now, there were lots of other people in Washington who recognized the importance. I didn't, I didn't dream up all of the personally, all the things that were in the bill, but, you know, Congress has thousands of bills at any given time, and it's only going to deal with some of them. And so there is a, the need to push something to get it off the siding and onto the main track and, and get the train pulling out of the station. And, and once you develop a little momentum, then other people will pay attention. It can become easier to keep the momentum going. But but it's not enough to just say, well, we have this study that was done of 87, and why don't we do a whole bunch of things? Because it tends to be that there is somebody who doesn't want almost everything, anything you're going to try and do, there's somebody who doesn't want it done. And it's much easier to stop things in a legislative environment than it is to make them happen. So um, 
But it, it certainly helped that you had Secretary Brady, um, who had chaired the commission looking into the 87 market break, and you had um, Robert Glauber, who was undersecretary of the Treasury, but most importantly, you had David Mullins, who was scary smart. I mean, David is, could have earned a Nobel Prize any time he wanted to turn his mind to it, I think. And um, so you had, he was Assistant Secretary of um, Domestic Finance, and um, before Jay Powell became, filled that position. And um, so you, you had some talented people who had done a very deep dive and had some, uh, um, <clears throat> some good knowledge, but the, now I'm not sure, just as I'm sitting here thinking about, um, I'm talking about the holding company legislation that we did pass. Now, I can't remember the name of the bill. There was a bill to deal with some of the Brady Commission stuff, which got into the SEC, CFTC, moving the regulation of stock index mm -hmm. futures, and that was a, that was a Treasury effort, not an SEC We'll, we'll get to that okay. one, too, because I know. And I forget what that was called, but that was, <laughs> should have been called Bull Run or, uh, <laughs> you know, Battle of the Little Bighorn Act of 1989. Let, let's shift gears and talk about IM a little bit um, because you're talking about modernizing sort of investment the management. Teams. Investment management. Okay. Now we're getting to something important. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you, I think you set up a task force pretty quickly to look at investment companies. Well, Yes, I did. So I, I entered, um, when I became chairman, I was um, very strongly of the belief that the mutual fund industry, I hate to call it an industry, that sounds like steel making and stuff, but that the, that the invention of the mutual fund and, and was um, one of the most important things that had happened to American consumers in the financial world. Um, and curiously, the 1940 Act, which and at the time it was passed, there were very few of these pooled funds. But people thought that there, they, you know, there were some and that they ought to have some regulation. And whether it, um, was by design or chance, I don't know, but the act that was written worked spectacularly well. And the statistics were, even then, um, mind-blowing of, of how much mutual fund assets and the number of funds and the choices that were offered had grown. And of course, that has continued over the intervening time with a steady expansion, and, um, and it gave the ordinary person the option, instead of just saying, I'm, I'm going to buy shares of some big company whose name they knew, um, or day trading if they were more active, although that was harder then, commission, the friction costs were, execution costs were higher, information was slower, so you didn't have as many people day trading, though you did always have that to some degree. But then you, the mutual fund gave people an opportunity to have highly talented professional managers, the pros on your side um, in the marketplace, hugely popular, rightly so. So uh, here we'd had 50 years of success, and the industry was um, very good at congratulating itself in their annual uh, conferences and such, and what a wonderful thing this industry is, and they were all getting riches, colossally rich. And the people who formed any of the big mutual fund complexes did exceptionally well. Um, and God bless them. That's the American economy. Uh, but. I was of the view that rather than just sitting back after 50 years and, and congratulating ourselves, we ought to worry about the next 50 years. And um, so I had the good fortune 
of having one of the most prodigiously talented women I have ever encountered, named Marianne Smythe, who had been my chief of staff. I thought she was so talented that I made her my chief of staff uh, early in my tenure. And then um, she had, and Marianne was an incredible talent in many respects. She had been a professor. So she had an academician's rigor for analysis and, and um, dissecting a problem uh, carefully and coolly. She had been in enforcement. She had been at the CFTC. So she had a broad view of the markets. She had the intellect of, uh, of a uh, a professor and, um, and more than the average person's um, uh, equipment of moxie. She, Marianne was, uh, uh, loved the commission and had been there long enough, knew lots of people. Anyway, I, in one of my, what I rate is uh, right up on a par with picking Michael Mann, uh, one of my other I don't want this to sound self-congratulatory, but one of my other brilliant appointments was to put Marianne Smythe as head of investment management. And having done so, I, and when I did so, I, in part it was I wanted somebody to be in charge of figuring out what do we need to do, if anything, what do we need to do to tweak this highly successful act so that we don't develop problems that would discredit this vital tool. I mean, in the response to the Jimmy Carter era, the thing that saved the middle class from what happened in Weimar, Germany, the thing that saved them was the invention of the money market fund. And everybody's grandmother and mother could take their money out of where it was losing 8% a year and put it in a perfectly safe, invested in government securities, but getting a current return so that they weren't being destroyed by inflation. So that had certainly been the most powerful demonstration I had seen of the creative powers of the market to solve what was otherwise a tremendous systemic problem and, and to do it in a consumer-friendly way, as opposed to over in the banking system where Fed's attitude was, well, at the time of the interest rate controls, well, you know, banks are making a lot of, good, lot of money. That, that's great for safety and soundness. Not so great for the customers. And um, so the, I felt that the 40 Act was tremendously important, but the money market funds and other developments were starting to get a field from the classic model of a pooled equities account being managed by somebody. So I asked Marianne to take her very best staff people, take them completely offline of normal responsibilities, and take a year, and more if they needed it, but hopefully they could do it in a year, and, and study the act and its origins and its current situation and everything we knew about what trends were going in the future, and develop recommendations for the commission and more broadly for Congress of uh, what needed to be done to equip us, best equip us for the second half century. And they did a wonderful job. A uh, lot of terrific um, enhancements came out of the study, uh, most of which were put into effect. Some were things the commission itself could do. Some were things that required legislation. So. Uh, this is the red book, right? Yes. So I've heard stories about why the book is red. Can you add anything? Well, to I attended Stanford University, and Stanford Cardinal, uh, our colors are red and white, and um, Marianne is a Tar Heel. And so the book was going to be Tar Heel Blue for a while, and uh, till the chairman got wind of it. And, um, and um, we had a friendly discussion of what the color choices could be. And it turned out 
they were running short of Tar Heel Blue ink in the <laughs> government printing office, and um, I discovered there was we could get a great deal on Cardinal Red. <laughs> so you pulled, can, can pulled we, rank. A 